part three section thirty three of the maine woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three the allegash and east branch section thirty three sunday august second was a cloudy and unpromising morning one of us observed to the indian you did not stretch your moose hide last night did you mr polis whereat he replied in a tone of surprise though perhaps not of ill humour what you ask me that question for suppose i stretch him you see him maybe your way talking may be all right no indian way i had observed that he did not wish to answer the same question more than once and was often silent when it was put again for the sake of certainty as if he were moody not that he was incommunicative for he frequently commenced a long-winded narrative of his own accord repeated at length the tradition of some old battle or some passage in the recent history of his tribe in which he had acted a prominent part from time to time drawing a long breath and resuming the thread of his tale with the true story-teller's leisureliness perhaps after shooting a rapid prefacing with well bye-bye etc as he paddled along especially after the day's work was over and he had put himself in posture for the night he would be unexpectedly sociable exhibit even the bonhomie of a frenchman and we would fall asleep before he got through his periods nikitao is called eleven miles from matawamkeg by the river our camp was therefore about nine miles from the latter place the indian was quite sick this morning with the colic i thought that he was the worse for the moose meat he had eaten we reached the matawamkeg at half past eight in the morning in the midst of a drizzling rain and after buying some sugar set out again the indian growing much worse we stopped in the north part of lincoln to get some brandy for him but failing in this an apothecary recommended brandreth's pills which he refused to take because he was not acquainted with them he said to me me doctor first study my case find out what ail em, then i know what to take we dropped down a little farther and stopped at mid forenoon on an island and made him a dipper of tea here too we dined and did some washing and botanizing while he lay on the bank in the afternoon we went on a little farther though the indian was no better burntibus as he called it was a long smooth lake-like reach below the five islands he said that he owned a hundred acres somewhere up this way as a thunder shower appeared to be coming up we stopped opposite a barn on the west bank in chester about a mile above lincoln here at last we were obliged to spend the rest of the day and night on account of our patient whose sickness did not abate he lay groaning under his canoe on the bank looking very woebegone yet it was only a common case of colic you would not have thought if you had seen him lying about thus that he was the proprietor of so many acres in that neighbourhood was worth six thousand dollars and had been to washington it seemed to me that like the irish he made a greater ado about his sickness than a yankee does and was more alarmed about himself we talked somewhat of leaving him with his people in lincoln for that is one of their homes and taking the stage the next day but he objected on account of the expense saying suppose me well in morning you and i go old town by noon as we were taking our tea at twilight while he lay groaning still under his canoe having at length found out what ailed him he asked me to get him a dipper of water taking the dipper in one hand he seized his powder horn with the other and pouring into it a charge or two of powder stirred it up with his finger and drank it off this was all he took to-day after breakfast beside his tea to save the trouble of pitching our tent when we had secured our stores from wandering dogs we camped in the solitary half-open barn near the bank with the permission of the owner lying on new-mown hay four feet deep the fragrance of the hay in which many ferns etc were mingled was agreeable though it was quite alive with grasshoppers which you could hear crawling through it this served to graduate our approach to houses and feather beds in the night some large bird probably an owl flitted through over our heads and very early in the morning we were awakened by the twittering of swallows which had their nests there monday august third we started early before breakfast the indian being considerably better and soon glided by lincoln and after another long and handsome lake-like reach we stopped to breakfast on the west shore 
two or three miles below this town. We frequently passed Indian islands with their small houses on them. The governor, Etion, lives in one of them, in Lincoln. The Penobscot Indians seem to be more social even than the whites. Ever and anon, in the deepest wilderness of Maine, you come to the log hut of a Yankee or Canada settler, but a Penobscot never takes up his residence in such a solitude. They are not even scattered about on their islands in the Penobscot, which are all within the settlements, but gathered together on two or three, though not always on the best soil, evidently for the sake of society. I saw one or two houses not now used by them, because, as our Indian polis said, they were too solitary. The small river emptying in at Lincoln is the Matanancook, which also we noticed was the name of a steamer moored there. So we paddled and floated along, looking into the mouths of rivers. When passing the Mohawk Rips, or, as the Indian called them, Mohawk Lips, four or five miles below Lincoln, he told us at length the story of a fight between his tribe and the Mohawks there, anciently, how the latter were overcome by stratagem, the Penobscots using concealed knives, but they could not for a long time kill the Mohawk chief, who was a very large and strong man, though he was attacked by several canoes at once when swimming alone in the river. From time to time we met Indians in their canoes going up river. Our man did not commonly approach them, but exchanged a few words with them at a distance in his tongue. These were the first Indians we had met since leaving the Umbazookskus. At Piscataquis Falls, just above the river of that name, we walked over the wooden railroad on the eastern shore about one and a half miles long, while the Indian glided down the rapids. The steamer from Old Town stops here, and passengers take a new boat above. Piscataquis, whose mouth we here passed, means branch. It is obstructed by falls at its mouth, but can be navigated with bateaux or canoes above through a settled country, even to the neighborhood of Moosehead Lake, and we had thought at first of going that way. We were not obliged to get out of the canoe after this on account of falls or rapids, nor, indeed, was it quite necessary here. We took less notice of the scenery today because we were in quite a settled country. The river became broad and sluggish, and we saw a blue heron winging its way slowly down the stream before us. We passed the Pasadumkeg River on our left and saw the blue Olaman Mountains at a distance in the southeast. Hereabouts our Indian told us at length the story of their contention with the priests respecting schools. He thought a great deal of education and had recommended it to his tribe. His argument in its favor was that if you had been to college and learnt to calculate, you could keep him property, no other way. He said that his boy was the best scholar in the school at Old Town, to which he went with whites. He himself is a Protestant and goes to church regularly at Old Town. According to his account, a good many of his tribe are Protestants, and many of the Catholics also are in favor of schools. Some years ago they had a schoolmaster, a Protestant, whom they liked very well. The priest came and said that they must send him away, and finally he had such influence, telling them that they would go to the bad place at last if they retained him, that they sent him away. The school party, though numerous, were about giving up. Bishop Fenwick came from Boston and used his influence against them. But our Indian told his side that they must not give up, must hold on, they were the strongest. If they gave up, then they would have no party. But they answered that it was no use, priests too strong, we'd better give up. At length he persuaded them to make a stand. The priest was going for a sign to cut down the liberty pole. So Polis and his party had a secret meeting about it. He got ready fifteen or twenty stout young men, stripped them naked and painted them like old times, and told them that when the priest and his party went to cut down the liberty pole, they were to rush up, take hold of it, and prevent them. And he assured them that there would be no war, only a noise. No war where priest is. He kept his men concealed in a house nearby, and when the priest's party were about to cut down the liberty pole, the fall of which would have been a death blow to the school party, he gave a signal, and his young men rushed out and seized the pole. There was a great uproar, and they were about coming to blows, but the priest interfered, saying, No war, no war, and so the pole stands, and the school goes on still. We thought that it showed a good deal of tact in him to seize this occasion and take his stand on it proving how well he understood those with whom he had to deal. 
the olaman river comes in from the east in greenbush a few miles below the passadumkeg when we asked the meaning of this name the indian said there was an island opposite its mouth which was called olaman that in old times when visitors were coming to old town they used to stop there to dress and fix up or paint themselves what is that which ladies used he asked rouge red vermilion dear he said that is larmon a kind of clay or red paint which they used to get here we decided that we too would stop at this island and fix up our inner man at least by dining it was a large island with an abundance of hemp nettle but i did not notice any kind of red paint there the olaman river at its mouth at least is a dead stream there was another large island in that neighborhood which the indian called sugul i e sugar island about a dozen miles before reaching old town he inquired how you like em your pilot but we postponed an answer till we had got quite back again the sunk haze another short dead stream comes in from the east two miles above old town there is said to be some of the best deer ground in maine on this stream asking the meaning of this name the indian said suppose you are going down penobscot just like we and you see a canoe come out of bank and go along before you but you know see em stream that is sunk haze he had previously complimented me on my paddling saying that i paddled just like anybody giving me an indian name which meant great paddler when off this stream he said to me who sat in the bows me teach you paddle so turning toward the shore he got out came forward and placed my hands as he wished he placed one of them quite outside the boat and the other parallel with the first grasping the paddle near the end not over the flat extremity and told me to slide it back and forth on the side of the canoe this i found was a great improvement which i had not thought of saving me the labor of lifting the paddle each time and i wondered that he had not suggested it before it is true before our baggage was reduced we had been obliged to sit with our legs drawn up and our knees above the side of the canoe which would have prevented our paddling thus or perhaps he was afraid of wearing out his canoe by constant friction on the side i told him that i had been accustomed to sit in the stern and lifting my paddle at each stroke give it a twist in order to steer the boat only getting a pry on the side each time and i still paddled partly as if in the stern he then wanted to see me paddle in the stern so changing paddles for he had the longer and better one and turning end for end he sitting flat on the bottom and i on the crossbar he began to paddle very hard trying to turn the canoe looking over his shoulder and laughing but finding it in vain he relaxed his efforts though we still sped along a mile or two very swiftly he said that he had no fault to find with my paddling in the stern but i complained that he did not paddle according to his own directions in the bows opposite the sunk haze is the main boom of the penobscot where the logs from far up the river are collected and assorted as we drew near to old town i asked polis if he was not glad to get home again but there was no relenting to his wildness and he said it makes no difference to me where i am such is the indian's pretense always we approached the indian island through the narrow strait called cook he said i spect we take in some water there river so high never see it so high at this season very rough water there but short swamp steamboat once don't you paddle till i tell you then you paddle right along it was a very short rapid when we were in the midst of it he shouted paddle and we shot through without taking in a drop soon after the indian houses came in sight but i could not at first tell my companion which of two or three large white ones was our guides he said it was the one with blinds we landed opposite his door at about four in the afternoon having come some forty miles this day from the piscataquis we had come remarkably and unaccountably quick probably as fast as the stage or the boat though the last dozen miles was dead water polis wanted to sell us his canoe said it would last seven or eight years or with care perhaps ten but we were not ready to buy it we stopped for an hour at his house where my companion shaved with his razor which he pronounced in very good condition mrs p wore a hat and had a silver brooch on her breast but she was not introduced to us the house was roomy and neat a large new map of old town and the indian island hung on the wall and a clock opposite to it 
wishing to know when the cars left old town polis's son brought one of the last bangor papers which i saw was directed to joseph polis from the office this was the last that i saw of joe polis we took the last train and reached bangor that night end of part three section thirty three Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. End of the Maine Woods by Henry David Thoreau.